Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the China History Podcast. Laszlo Montgomery coming to you for the 205th time. You know, lately, immigration has been well, more of a front and center issue than usual here in the U.S., as I record this anyway. For many of us who think these times we live in are so cold and heartless, well, historically, it's really sort of business as usual. A new chapter and an old story. We tend to view things through the prism of events that happen in our own lifetime, or maybe as far back as the generation before us. You know, that's the history most familiar to us. But history has been repeating and rhyming for as long as it's been recorded. And so, I wanted to tell you a story from the annals of Chinese American history. It takes place during the exclusion years, 1882 to 1943. The backstory for these times have been told and retold in past CHP episodes. This tale had a twist to it that sort of appealed to me. That is, the story took place in a rather obscure part of a state that you know, usually doesn't get the top billing it deserves when discussing Chinese American history. That's right. I'm talking about the Beaver State, the ninth biggest state in the country, admitted to the Union on Valentine's Day, 1859, the state of Oregon. But our story doesn't take place in the Chinatown of Portland or anywhere near the Pacific Coast. No, this one takes place 260 miles to the east in that geographic slice of Oregon sandwiched in between the Umatilla and Malheur National Forests. The closest city that may come to mind around those parts isn't even in Oregon. It's Walla Walla, Washington. Baseball fans might have heard of that place. It's a three-hour drive to the north from where our story takes place, about a 30-hour drive to Kalamazoo. The locus of this episode is the town of John Day, Oregon. John Day was an American trapper and hunter who made a name for himself during his years up in the Pacific Northwest, that is, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, western Montana, and southern British Columbia, Canada. Now, for someone not terribly well-known, he sure had a lot of places named after him. Most famous would be the John Day River, the third longest free-flowing river in the lower 48 states. It's a tributary of the Columbia. Free-flowing, that means nothing gets in its way, no dams or anything. There's also Dayville, Oregon, 31 miles to the west, and Dayville isn't too far from the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument on the John Day Highway. You can't miss it. Some of you may recall CHP 194, the episode on the history of Toysan and U.S. immigration. Now, the two men I wanted to focus on today came from there, and no surprise. In the early days, the Toysan Chinese comprised the largest majority, by far, of the Chinese diaspora who came to the U.S. Today's heroes are Mr. Ing He and Mr. Long An, or Liang Guangrong, in Mandarin. Ing He's gravestone says his name was Wu Yunian, and he was born Qing Tongzhi Yunian, that is, during the first year of the Qing Dynasty Tongzhi Emperor's reign, or 1863, in Xiaping Village. These two men, Ing He and Long An, they had a rather special story, and thanks to the love and efforts of a whole bunch of Oregonians committed to preserving their legacy, a lot of this tale is well documented. So let's relive the experience of these two Toysan immigrants and how together they built their American dream. Not on Mott Street, not on Grant Street or Alameda Street. They did it out in eastern Oregon, in a town I'm betting most of you had never heard of prior to just now. Let's look at Ing He. His story about how he ended up on a steamer to Gold Mountain is as unspectacular as 19th century Chinese immigration stories go. Like almost everyone else, he followed in the footsteps of some male relatives who probably left in the aftermath of the horrors of the Taiping Rebellion and all the other natural and man-made disasters that struck southern China in the 1860s and 1870s. These male relatives, or uncles of Ing He, as the legend has it, were also under suspicion by the Qing authorities for their alleged anti-Manchu activities. 
whatever the case may be, they blazed the familiar trail, worked in mining and railroads, established themselves in the United States, and when they had cash flow, they wrote back to the village in Toysan and said it was safe for others to follow. Sometime in the early 1880s, when anti-Chinese rhetoric was reaching a crescendo and the Chinese Exclusion Act was becoming reality, Ng He and his father headed towards the U.S. West Coast and then on to Walla Walla, Washington, where these five uncles had set themselves up. Ng He and his father started their American adventure in 1883. How they managed to slip through the exclusion net, it's hard to say. One theory has it they probably entered the country in Port Townsend, north of Seattle. Word on the street was that this port of entry was a lot more lax than dealing with the federal authorities down in the big cities. It had been just shy of 80 years since Lewis and Clark had passed through those parts, but it was still very much a frontier and all that that entailed. Whether Ng He got to Walla Walla by this way or not, it's hard to say for sure. Canada had also become a reliable launching pad for a future life in America, and there were plenty of Toysan operatives who were in the business of sneaking prospective Americans into the country. Everyone knows all about the California gold rush that began in 1849, Sutter's Mill. They had their own gold rush in both East and West Oregon that happened the same time, 1850s. In 1855, they had a big one in Idaho, too. The whole Pacific Northwest, in fact. Mid-19th century, you could say lots of gold mining going on. And because of this dynamic, a lot of the early infrastructure that came to those parts and opened it up and networked that land with the states east of there came about primarily as a result of gold mining. And this infrastructure gave a lot of these frontier regions enough traction to reach critical mass and become full-fledged communities. Now, the quarter century, lasting from 1860 to 1885, those were the peak years for Chinese settlement in Oregon. California? That was a crowded and very mature market to try and make one's fortune. Oregon, the next state to the north, now that place presented all kinds of opportunities. Portland and Seattle were thriving, but the eastern third of Oregon, that was still some rough country. There was also a safe amount of distance between these parts and the worst of the anti-Chinese violence that was happening in all the Chinatowns of the coastal cities. That isn't to say eastern Oregon was a safe place for Chinese. It wasn't. The stories of lynchings, massacres, and random acts of murder and other forms of violence were common in these still largely lawless places. A favorite pastime for some of the locals was to get all liquored up and ride out to the closest Chinatown or Chinese mining village and shoot the place up. Countless unmarked graves are scattered over the whole Pacific Northwest of the United States of mostly Toysan immigrants and laborers. Random acts of violence. Wrong place, wrong time. They never made it back to Guangdong. In the most extreme case from the history books, over in Hell's Canyon on the Snake River, the border of Oregon and Idaho, that's the northeast corner of Oregon. In the Wallowa Whitman National Forest, there's a monument to a massacre of 34 Chinese miners, minding their own business, panning for gold in these remote parts. Some ruffians came upon them and shot them all in cold blood, every single one of them. And like with the case of Vincent Chin up in Detroit in June 1982, nothing happened to the killers. They got off easy. The monument that marks the spot of the massacre says, this is the site of the eighteen eighty seven massacre of as many as thirty four Chinese gold miners. No one was held accountable. In a well worn path followed by many immigrants to this country, including my own family, Ing He ended up wherever he had the safety net of a family. In his case, that was out in Walla Walla, and I guess you could say that pretty much sealed his fate as far as 
where he was destined to carve out a life. Now, thanks to Walla Walla's relative central location to where all the mining operations were happening in the Pacific Northwest, it was quite a boomtown back in the 1800s. Wherever there was a boomtown, there was always a budding Chinese immigrant community getting a piece of the action. Walla Walla was no exception. Thousands of Chinese called that place home. Ing Hei's surname, as I said, was Wu. Now, that Wu surname in Cantonese was pronounced Ng. N-G. No vowels to help you out with that surname. And for that reason, here in the land of the free, home of the brave, most people with this surname in the American dialect, well, they just became Ings. And there were plenty of Ings spread out all over late 19th century Washington and Oregon. Although these Ings already in the U.S. weren't blood relatives, technically Ing He could claim he was from the same clan. Chinese immigrants tended to separate themselves into these kinds of sub-communities. And if you couldn't find anyone with the same surname, eh, the next best thing was to have come from the same village. It created a, a bond where nothing existed before. And in these faraway places, with so many people inherently hostile to Asian immigrants... Now, there was strength and support in numbers, so they all hung out with their own. Ing He, from about 1883 to 1887, he did the whole full-course meal of coolie, bitter labor. That's where we get the word coolie. He did it all. This thirst for Chinese labor out in Oregon and Idaho and in Washington was almost insatiable. Even during the dark days of the 1870s, when a lot of Americans were hating on the Chinese... In the Pacific Northwest, well, they couldn't do without them, so they were quite welcome. Suddenly one day, Ing He's father said yeah, he had had enough, and he was going to cash out and return to China. Now, we'll never know why, but in 1887, after his father had left, Ing He decided to bid his Walla Walla uncles a fond adieu, and south he went in the direction of another thriving boomtown in eastern Oregon called Canyon City the county seat of Grant County. Not a lot going on there today, but when Ing He arrived on the scene, the place was still hopping. When Ing He arrived in John Day, Oregon, well, it wasn't called John Day yet. The town was quite new. In the year 1880, it was the third largest Chinatown in the U.S. Over 2,000 Huaren, Chinese, called the place their home away from home. All the Chinese living there comprised the majority at first. They called the place Newtown, for lack of any other suitable name. The location, for my fellow Amerikanskis and any foreign tourists, is where the U.S. Route 26 meets the 395. The Three Flags Highway, I kid you not, the 395 terminates in the south, less than an hour away from where I'm recording this. So U.S. Highways 26 and 395, where those two roads meet up in eastern Oregon, that's where the story of Ing He and Long An begins. I mentioned Ing He went to a place called Canyon City. That was where all the action was, and where a lot of Chinese resided. Well, the Canyon City Chinatown got burned down, a common hazard amongst the Chinese immigrants. And when the Chinese inhabitants there tried to rebuild, all of a sudden there were, you know, no Chinese allowed signs everywhere. So some didn't want any trouble and moved to Idaho, and some went to Washington. And others, like Ing He, they walked about 45 minutes north to the John Day River, where many Chinese had already migrated to. Long An, he got to John Day before Ing He, and so already had the lay of the land. How to describe him? In his photos, Long An looks unremarkable, but he can only be described as a fearless go-getter, someone with long-term vision, a real force of nature a rambling, gambling man, and he had been educated. Back in China during his youth, he had read and understood the classics. He could read and write classical Chinese, was very skillful in calligraphy. He understood the I Ching and brought all that classical wisdom to the frontier. Not sure when, but people started calling him Leon. The other distinguishing characteristic about Long An was that in his short time in America, maybe five years only, he had been able to pick up English and spoke it quite well, and he could read and write, too. Ing He, on the other hand, 
Eh, he spoke that pidgin English, you know, you've heard in a hundred movies. So Long An had a much easier time navigating the rickety bridge that joined his Chinese race with the white settlers of the mountains, hills, and forests of eastern Oregon. And because of his fluency in English, Long An had made himself useful to the man. He was often sought out as a translator for all kinds of U.S. customs and immigration matters involving the Chinese. When Ying He rolled into town, Long An latched onto him quite quickly. First of all, they were both Toysan guys. Now, that was one bonding agent. But, well, truthfully, all these laborers, laundrymen, miners, and cooks, they were mostly all Toysan anyway. The Ing clan in these parts, southeast Washington, southwest Idaho, northeast Oregon, the Ings were quite well represented. So for a Leung, like Long An, to plug himself into the Ing clan through a relationship with Ing He, well, it had its distinct advantages, especially where business was concerned. Long An also learned that Ing He seemed to be quite familiar with Zhong Yi TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. Now, this was true. Ying He, he learned it up in Walla Walla from another Chinese named Doc Li. Now, Doc Li, who knows how, but he had acquired some repute out in that wild country as a healer of sorts. But the one thing that Doc Li was particularly adept at, and what he taught Ying He, was pulsology. Mai Chen. I'm not sure how many of you have ever heard of that. When you query it in Wikipedia, there isn't even an entry. I googled the term as well and didn't get too terribly much back. There are a ton of documented anecdotes about his skills as a pulsologist that made it down to our day. They all went something like this. Doc Hay felt my pulse, figured out my illness, prescribed me some herbs, and I was cured. He had this special gift, and whatever this forgotten... Chinese immigrant Doc Lee taught Ing He, he brought it to John Day, Oregon. And this amazing skill and ability turned him into a legend. In TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, there are 12 to 14 pulses. Each one is located in a certain part of your body and corresponds to a specific organ. So by measuring these 14 pulses, you could discover what has gone awry inside you, your lungs, bladder, stomach, heart, liver, whatever. Ing He had mastered this. He'd take his three fingers on his right hand, feel the pulses of these patients, and he knew. He knew exactly what was wrong with them, and he had just the concoction, perfected over the centuries, to cure this ailment. Furthermore, Ing He, from his days back in the home village in Toysan, Supposedly, he picked up a few good pharmacology tips, and I guess he knew his Ban Cao Jing. A part of his legend purports that he actually came from a long line of Chinese herbalists. So Long An saw in Ying He someone who had a unique and deadly necessary skill set that could do quite well out on the frontier. So these two unlikely partners, one outgoing and boisterous, the other a bit more reserved, joined together in business, and set themselves up in a building that became known as the Gamwa Zhang, the Jinhua Chang, Golden Flower Prosperity. That was the building that Ying He operated out of and saw patients. Long An and Ying He both lived there as well. I guess yeah, you could call it a, a multi-use structure, small as it was. It was their office. It was where they lived. It was a a general store that sold Chinese goods and all manners of frontier necessities of life. That included such commodities as tobacco and booze, the number one sellers there. The Gamwa Zhong also had a no-frills inn for Chinese laborers passing through town who, you know, needed a place to flop. But they stuck they stuck four in a bed there. You could buy lottery tickets at the Gamwa Jong, you know, Long An. He ran his own lottery. The place was also a makeshift gambling and opium den, a favorite pastime of Chinese miners, I guess you could say. It was also a joss house and contained a shrine for Buddhists to pray at. Ying He was very devout. And with as many Chinese living in and around John Day like there were, well, this building simply became like 
you know, like the Elks Lodge or the local YMCA. This is where all the local Chinese there would hang. And Long An had an old Victrola there that always had some Chinese opera recordings going. And any company or organization looking to hire Chinese laborers came to Gamwa Zheng to do the recruiting for miles around. This was the center of the Chinese immigrant population. And Long An made a little spare change on all the transactions he got involved in. And for this reason, and for his innate business and investment skills, he died a very wealthy man. Now, the medical side of the business was quite lucrative. Most of these towns that sprang up during the second half of the 19th century didn't have the luxury of their own town doctor. So if you got sick or injured, yeah, you were on your own. But the town of John Day had Doc Hay. In time, his abilities to cure patients using these, well, in the eyes of the people there, these unfamiliar but effective Chinese folk remedies achieved quite a bit of renown out in eastern Oregon. You know, advanced medicine, as we know it today, is, well, if you follow the timeline going back to Hippocrates, that's a fairly recent phenomenon. I mean, even in my own children's lifetime, medicine has come such a long way. But prior to the 20th century, in Ing Hay's time, let's say, medicine and surgery were still pretty backward and horrific. Now, I'm not saying being a doctor was a blue-collar job, but, well, it required a lot of experience and skill because there simply wasn't enough known at that time. So many things we take for granted, like, you know, sterilization, for example. Nobody knew about that, on the frontier at least. So when you got sick back then, or worse, injured, or had some kind of an infection, Western medicine didn't have such a great track record. And if it was... Something that required you to go under the knife? That was practically a death sentence in and of itself. But Ing He, he had absorbed a good amount of this 2,000-year-old accumulated heritage of Chinese medicine and brought it to the Oregon frontier. And the people, no matter their race or religion, were quite glad to have access to it. They might have found the cures bitter and foul-tasting and uncomfortable as can be. But for most of the ailments, aches, and pains that happened out in that rough and rugged part of the beaver state, Ing He, this China doctor, as he came to be called, eh, he had a treatment that worked. His friend and partner, Long An, was a major macher in the, in the Seiyup Association. You remember the Seiyup from that Toisan episode? The Si Yi, the four contiguous counties of Xinhui, Taishan, Kaiping and Unping, this Seiyup Association, or Tong, well, it served the same purpose out in those parts of eastern Oregon that the Tongs of any Chinatown did. So he was always being sought out and was a giant fish in what was a relatively small pond compared to San Fran and other urban Chinatowns. So when we think of the Chinese immigration experience and how gold was the driving force behind its early history, 1850s to the 1880s, those were the boom years. Gold mines, the railroads, the connecting of America. About halfway into the 1880s, though, came the bust. 1890s and right into the turn of the century, the good times were over. And though plenty of Chinese still scratched around for gold dust and whatever hadn't been picked clean yet, most migrated to the next great thing out west, which was ranching. And that was as labor-intensive a job as there ever was. And so, perfect for the Chinese immigrants trying to sell their muscles to the highest bidders. So, some went in that direction and worked on the ranches. There was also work to be found in, you know, commercial agriculture, domestic service, and, you know, the salmon canneries. Many other John Day-based Chinese made their way west to Portland or Seattle, where there were already thriving, mature Chinatowns to rely on for safety and support. Those times after the bust, it was a difficult time for everyone, not just Chinese immigrants. Some of these men from Toisan and All parts of the Pearl River Delta region who couldn't find work and still hadn't managed to acquire their fortune, 
They couldn't return to China. I mean, the humiliation would be too great. This group had it especially rough. I mean, suicides were a common exit strategy for many men who weren't able to make their American dreams happen. Over in John Day at the Gamwa Jong, Long An and Ing He saw firsthand how the numbers in this once thriving Chinese community began slowly melting away. There wasn't anything left there, at least not enough to keep the Chinese workers from leaving and moving on to the next thing. By 1900, less than 100 Chinese called John Day home. By 1940, there were fewer than a couple dozen. This wasn't the only town west of the Continental Divide that met this fate, but John Day was a pretty well-documented example of one such town that rode the gold rush all the way to the top and then all the way down. It was no doubt sad for Ing He and Long An to witness the decline of this once thriving Chinese community in John Day. In its heyday, this band of brothers who all came from Guangdong province, they all used to congregate together there, and some stayed a few years or only for a few nights, and it was usually at the Gamwa Zhong, this old wooden structure. They would all come and, you know, sort of hung out, speaking their Toisan dialects, being themselves, immersed in their familiar culture, but at the same time, living on the edge in these parts of the West, far off the beaten path, followed by most of their countrymen. Each year, the numbers got smaller, but the Gamwa Zhong remained the center of that tiny community, as diminished as it was. As I said in past episodes where I presented slices of Chinese-American history, some immigrants came only for the fortune to be made. And once that was done, their plans were to return to China. But there were those who after they arrived and got settled, saw the possibilities and weighed them against the sorry state of affairs in late Qing Dynasty China and figured they'd take their chances in this brave new world. That was Ing He and Long An. Most of their Chinese colleagues and countrymen who they had come to know during the 1880s and 90s had mostly all bailed, but they stayed. And don't forget, from 1882 on, They were living under the stigma and inconvenience of the Chinese exclusion laws. That was all playing out in the background to exacerbate the hideous fate of many early Chinese immigrants. As far as their apothecary business, Long An continued to help Ing He mix the herbs and roots and whatnot and got everything packaged and dispatched to patients. Ing He had about 500 different prescriptions. Chinese medicine had been more than a thousand years of careful observation, trial, and error that had preceded everything further perfected by Ing He out on the frontier. I mean, he wasn't just making this stuff up. The Western people who came to Ing He continued to believe these strange treatments to be miracle cures. Now, they might have been miracles out on the Oregon frontier in the early 1900s, but In China, these had been common treatments going back to the Tang Dynasty. People knew of Ing He and the Gamwa Zhang from hundreds of miles around. From Washington State down to Nevada, word had spread about Ing He's skills as a doctor. And the afflicted came from every direction, but some couldn't come. So what people used to do back then in these pre-WebMD.com times... They'd mail a letter to Ing He and do their best to describe their symptoms. Now, Long An would read these letters, and then Ing He would do his best to diagnose what was wrong, and together with Long An, they'd mix up some ingredients and mail that to the patient. And Long An, being the more educated and literate of the two in English, he was always tasked with writing up the instructions to the patient. Now, this mail-order drug business became quite lucrative and steady. A lot of times it involved just refilling prescriptions to old patients and dropping them in the mail. After 1910, well, there simply weren't enough Chinese left in and around John Day to make a living. But Ing He did very well making the transition from treating primarily Chinese laborers to the non-Chinese who populated that part of America. 
As Long An knew, back when he met Ying He, there was a big market for these services. Blood poisoning happened to be one of the more common afflictions in those parts. That's the non-medical term for bacteremia and septicemia. And TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, was on the cutting edge back then, old as it was, in treating these killer infections. In some cases, so spectacular would be the comeback for the patient that it would become one of the many stories people would tell and get passed around. I mean, there were a lot of tales, some tall tales, I'm guessing, of some of Ing He's more miraculous comeback patients. Now, besides blood poisoning, other common maladies back in that day in those hinterlands were meningitis, lower back pain, mumps, colds, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, stomach problems, and one other big one. That was influenza. And there were two deadly outbreaks of influenza, 1915 and 1919. Now, of the 500 million people around the world who were affected by the 1919 flu or Spanish flu, a lot of them caught it in eastern Oregon. Three to five percent of the world's population at that time, right at the conclusion of World War I, perished from this outbreak. But as the story goes, none of them were Ing Hay's patients. There was a story about how during the height of this, this Spanish flu pandemic outbreak, when people were dropping like flies, Ing Hay and Long An mixed up a massive batch of Chinese medicinal herbs and took them around the vicinity of John Day and other places where there were large populations of laborers building roads and tunnels. And it's said all of those who were treated with Doc Hay's foul-tasting medicine, they survived. When everyone else perished from this virus. House calls were common. Sometimes it meant Ying He and Long An driving long distances in very nasty weather. You know, Long An used to do the driving at first by you know horse and buggy and later on by automobile. The years wore on and after so many lives had been saved and so many debilitating ailments had been cured and after so many legends and stories had been passed around the Pacific Northwest about Ying He's ability to diagnose and treat any disease just by feeling one's pulse. I mean, he, he had become downright revered, a revered and respected physician in a land, well, back then at least, where most physicians opted to pass on, you know, perhaps because of the rough living, the, the prospects, and the clientele. But a Chinese immigrant from Toysan, he stayed and served that community. Let me quote from China doctor of John Day, Jeffrey Barlow and Christine Richardson, quote, He was one of the last horse and buggy doctors in the John Day area. Like other old-fashioned doctors, he became almost part of the family. He would go to remote places to treat people and remain at their bedsides until their suffering was relieved. Unlike many old-time doctors, he could cure many fatal illnesses. He truly embodied the ideal of the immigrant who had come to stay. He brought his old country's training and skills to a new land and practiced the healing arts among a strange, but in the end, friendly people. End quote. As the 20th century progressed and as parts of the frontier became more settled, other Western physicians came and set up their practice there. So Wing Hei was no longer the only game in town for treatment. And these Western doctors would sometimes collude to put all kinds of pressures on Ying Hei, such as, you know, getting his practice shut down for licensing issues or for some infraction or another. As the share price of Western medicine rose, well, Chinese medicine declined. He continued to operate out of the Gamwa Chang building. That was Long An and Ing He's Googleplex, all in one campus. Long An managed his whole business empire from there, his investments and stocks and bonds. I mean, he had real estate holdings throughout the Pacific Northwest, including in British Columbia. He bought patents for all kinds of devices and gadgets. And as soon as the car became king in America, he opened up the first auto dealership in eastern Oregon. And it doubled as an old-fashioned filling station, too. And it was called the Tourist Garage. 
They continued to run their mail-order Chinese medicine business. Ying He continued to see patients, and it never ceased to amaze these frontiersmen how his delicate fingers could feel certain pulses in their body, and from these sensations, invisible to most humans, he could pick them up, and he knew. He knew where the problem was. Some of the techniques he used went all the way back to the Huangdi Neijing, the inner canon of the Yellow Emperor. This ancient and classic work is attributed to the mythical Yellow Emperor, Huangdi. It actually came out during either the late Warring States or early Han. Now, that work contained the state of the art as far as where Chinese medicine was at that time. The Huangdi Neijing was the first, or one of the first works, to break from the unscientific beliefs about what caused disease and instead used careful observation and other more scientific methods to diagnose an illness. Here in this Huangdi Neijing, it stated, everything about the body is all related to the yin, yang, qi, and the wu xing, the five elements, wood, fire, earth, metal, water. <laughs> yeah, Ying He brought this knowledge and expertise from the heartland of ancient China to the mountains and valleys of eastern Oregon in the late 1800s and into the 1900s. Because of the whole history of early Chinese immigration, the way it all panned out with labor driving the whole process and then the exclusion laws kicking in when they did, well, the ratio of Chinese men to women in the U.S. was quite unfavorable to a bachelor trying to get hooked up with a Chinese wife. So this created an entire subculture among these men about you know how they coped with it. And Long An, despite the huge frown on American society's face about the mixing of the races, crossed over all the time and enjoyed relationships with Caucasian women. You know, he was someone who had a personality. He spoke perfect English. He had a gift for the gab. He had money. I mean, you could stop right after a good personality and that's often enough for some people. So Long An, eh, he was a player. But he and Ying He, they never married. They never had kids. So those two, they built quite a life for themselves. But in true first-generation immigrant fashion, till their last days, they lived quite humbly and frugally. I mean, if you walked into the Gamwa Chung and saw them, I mean, you wouldn't know they'd be worth millions and, you know, our day's dollars. But they did it. Ying He and Long An, they came, they created value, and brought their collective smarts, wits, and skills to a part of the U.S. that was still in its early development stages, and they thrived. They decided at the beginning they were going to stay, and both saw assimilation as the only path to acceptance, and they won that acceptance, something that wasn't so easy, you know, coming from Asia like they did. So they both came and they both stayed. They never went back to China. You could say Ying He and Long An both cut the cord. I mean, the proper thing to do in their culture anyway was to, you know, send remittances back to their village. I mean, they both had families, wife, kids. And of course, it was well, appropriate to sail back and visit every now and then. And these two guys left, never looked back. They transported all those thousands of years of Chinese culture with them to this new land, and they wrapped themselves up in this culture, and it was part of them till their dying days. But at the same time, they had become Americans. Let me quote from a letter sent to Long An in March 1905 from someone back in the village, back in Toisan. This was typical of the kind of missives they'd get all the time. Quote, Two years ago, your mother passed away. Last year, your daughter married. Your aged father is paralyzed. He will pass away soon. Your wife feels neglected. The neighbors are moved by her melancholy and ill fortune. Come back as soon as you receive this. And if you don't return, you should send money home for your family's expenses. End quote. Wow, talk about a guilt trip. How should Long An have felt after receiving something like that? Well... Yeah, it is reasons, I guess. You know, this was Chinese exclusion time. And even legal citizens like Ying He and Long An had to deal with the whole complicated and risky process of getting out of and getting back into the United States. 
and being Chinese at the same time. They stayed put. Had too many stories had been heard about Chinese-American citizens who made the mistake of trusting the system only to find out when they came back to the United States the door was locked, and it stayed this way till 1943. Like thousands of others in their similar situations, stretching from Los Angeles to Boston and back again, Ing He and Long An were loyal supporters of Sun Yat-sen. In past episodes, I've mentioned this. A lot of Sun Yat-sen's early efforts to create a new Chinese republic were bankrolled by overseas Chinese, including these two, living out in the eastern wilds of the Beaver State. In April 1940, Long An died. His gravestone says he was born in Xinhui in 1863, so that made him 77 years old at the time of his death. He left everything to Doc Hay. I mean, they had been a team for more than half a century. Well, with the passing of his closest and most trusted friend, that was pretty much the beginning of the end for Ing He, I guess you could say. His health already wasn't what it used to be. His eyesight had dimmed to the point where he was legally blind. He had depended on Long An for so much, not only in his medical and pharmacy practice, but you know, for his English skills as well. Ing He was left with only one place to turn to. Word got out to some of Ing He's relatives living out in that part of the country. A nephew, E.B. Wing, stepped up and arranged for his brother, located conveniently in Idaho, to head to John Day and take care of Ing He. Now, this brother, named Bob Wah, just by chance was also a trained herbalist, so he had that in common with Ing He and sort of took over this business. And Bob moved his whole family lock, stock, and barrel to John Day. And in this perfect kind of environment, Ing He lived out his days. Long An and that whole gang of Toisan Hing Dai, or brothers, who orbited the Gamwa Jiang for so many years, they had been Ing He's family all his adult life. They were all gone. But now Ing He got to enjoy the pleasures of being a, a yeah, yeah a grandpa of his own family, adopted though it was. He continued to live at the Gamwa Jeong building. Bob Wa and family lived just down the street a bit. Ing He wasn't in the position to treat patients any longer, but believe it or not, the mail-order Chinese medicinal herbs business continued to be brisk. But with the outbreak of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937 and World War II, the supply chain for Chinese herbs was impacted profoundly. So Ying He spent most of his time inside the Gamwa Jiang building. Bob Wa and his family looked after him until Bob's wife Rose passed away and the kids left John Day to build a life elsewhere. For Ying He, his end came in a familiar fashion that spelled the demise of so many of the elderly. He was alone at home and fell and broke his hip. This was in 1948. Bob Wah took him to a hospital in Portland, and then after that ordeal, he placed Ing He in an old folks' home there. And that's where Ing He lived out the rest of his days. When he drove away from the Gamwa Jiang that night after falling and breaking his hip, he didn't know that he'd never see that place again. He lived in that nursing home in Portland for four years. People came to visit him, but you know how it is. It was a lot of sitting around and thinking about his past life. He fell again in 1952, and due to neglect by the nursing home staff, he died from pneumonia after being left on a cold metal table inside an examining room. Well, 1862 to 1952, that's almost 90 years. Not a bad run for a former opium smoker and cigar addict. As for the Gamwa Chang, well, Ying He didn't die broke, but he also didn't have that much left from what Long An had bequeathed to him. The Gamwa Chang building went to Bob Wa, who deeded it to the city of John Day in 1955. He had asked the city to turn it into some sort of museum to show posterity the contribution of the Chinese immigrants to the area. Eh, it just got forgotten and was all boarded up. Well, Bob passed away in 1966. His second wife, who 
got to claim the dubious distinction of being John Day's last Chinese resident, moved away to San Francisco. And that was the end of that. The building became one of those familiar eyesores we've all seen in some of our towns and cities, and people wondered, who owns that place? Well, one day in 1967, someone in the city of John Day chanced upon some documents that showed that, in fact, the city owned the Gamwa Zhang. So a whole bunch of good people and local organizations mobilized and went inside, and no kidding. Everything was just as Ng Hay had left it in 1948 when Bob Waugh drove him to the hospital in Portland to get his hip treated. I guess he was sure he'd be coming back, so whatever he had pending stayed that way for 19 years. The same food offerings were sitting before his little Buddhist shrine. So everything inside was studied, photographed, cataloged, and lovingly and painstakingly put back together by a whole big group of lovers of Oregon history who have demonstrated the most heartfelt and loyal commitment to preserving this amazing legacy of Ing He, Long An, and all the other Chinese immigrants who were part of this amazing story. And since pretty much the entirety of their story could be told inside that Gamwa Zhang structure, it's been put back together and turned into a museum and state heritage site. Let me read a few excerpts from Ing He's obituary, dated January 25th, 1952, from the Blue Mountain Eagle, Grant County's newspaper since 1868. Quote, Ing Doc Hay is dead. With his death in Portland last Saturday, a symbol of a past and colorful era in Grant County history passed on. Doc Hay's life in Grant County is so interwoven with the old mining history and the history of the Chinese colony in eastern Oregon that there are hundreds of stories and anecdotes brought to light by his passing. Because he always avoided publicity and talked little of the past, even to relatives, much of the lore of his life has been lost. When the Chinese Exclusion Act was about to be enacted and Doc had to prove residence to establish citizenship, he went to Walla Walla and obtained an elector's certificate to establish his status. This certificate bears the date of July 31, 1897, and attested that he had voted in an election there prior to that date. His ability as a Chinese herb doctor became legendary in eastern Oregon. Stories are recounted of the early days when he would travel as far as Prineville by horse and buggy to treat patients. Among the contents of the old store where the doc spent his last years are papers, letters, and uncanceled checks, all of which provided a rich storehouse of research material in studying the early days of the county. Among this material are uncanceled checks, many of them dating back to the 1900s, mostly in small amounts and written by many pioneers of the county, now gone. The amount of uncashed checks is estimated to total close to $20,000, end quote. Ing He, the arc of his long life, he got to witness firsthand the post-Taiping Rebellion mess that China became. He was part of that great Chinese diaspora of the late 1800s. He lived through all that, too. And he made it to the presidency of Harry S. Truman. He got to see quite a bit of history in his lifetime and played his small role in the history of the American West at a time when it was on the cusp of being linked up with mainstream America. But in Ng Hay's time, it was still a wild and violent frontier. He and other Chinese put on a brave face during Chinese exclusion, and despite the odds, Ng Hay, Long An, and others too, whose stories are yet to be told, they came, they stayed, they built a life. And here these two friends died. Both Ing He and Long An were interred at John Day Cemetery. Oh, and by the way, they were both members of the Order of Freemasons, and Ing He and Long An both had Masonic funerals. The primary source for this episode was written by the late Dr. Jeffrey Barlow and his wife and partner, Christine Richardson. The book is called China Doctor of John Day. I found it online at Half Price Books. You can order it from the Gamwa Zhang Museum website, too. I'll have all those links on my webpage, as usual, I might add. If you Google Doc Hay or Gamwa Zhang, 
there are actually a lot of videos and whatnot that take you inside and explain a lot of interesting stuff about these two guys and the times they lived in. The Gamwajong building got itself written into the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. And then 32 years later, in 2005, it was designated a National Historic Landmark. So, thank you everyone who indulged me on this episode. I hope it met with your general approval. I want to thank good old Anita, Li Ming Shi, over in NYC for bringing Ing Hei to my attention. Anita's a big-time TCM doctor there, and <clears throat> let me say uh, 39 years ago when I first started studying Mandarin at the University of Illinois, she was my classmate. Thanks, Anita. And a shout-out to my man, Jeffrey Summer, representing my favorite city in the South, Gainesville, Georgia. Jeffrey's one of my top listeners, and not only Gainesville, but I believe all of Hall County. Jeffrey Summer, a loyal CHP listener. Thanks, Jeffrey. I hope you all enjoyed this episode that showcased the great state of Oregon. You know, this really isn't one of the state's claims to fame, but the Moors, Lee and Rob, they write, produce, and present the History of Chinese Literature podcast out of that place. You know who else? Yeah, the Elvis and Beatles combined of history podcasters. Dan Carlin, Beaver State. And this isn't for certain, but well, it might possibly be the future home of Laszlo Montgomery, as retirement is not too far away. If that state was good enough for Ng Hei and Long An, yeah, it's certainly good enough for the likes of me. All right, mes amis, congrats to La France winning the World Cup. That was the fastest month in my life. Seems like that Russia KSA match was only yesterday. Four more years to wait till the 2022 World Cup opener on November 21st, 2022. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Trust me when I say there's more where this came from. Coming your way sooner or later. Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the capital of Southern California, the city of Los Angeles. Do consider joining me again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.